Greetings, listeners. We're back once again to talk to you about the Cthulhu Mythos, its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits like the dreamlands, or things of a weird nature, or things that are lovecrafty and leaning, weird fiction, science fiction, horror, learn of terrible meetings in lonely places, of cyclopean ruins, and vast staircases that lead down to abysses of knighted secrets, of complex angles that lead through invisible walls to other regions of space and time, and of hideous explorations in remote and forbidden places on other worlds and in different time-space continua. From the creation of our galaxy to the death of the sun, this is an exploration of the Cthulhu mythos from the perspective of humans' concept of history. We are the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. You can find us at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos starts now. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Season 8. Greetings and welcome to The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. I am your host, D.B. Spitzer. And between episodes, let's see... 107 and 134, we will be talking about The Beetle. The Beetle, a mystery, is a 1897 horror novel by British writer Richard Marsh. To tell you about it is to spoil it. So check it out, and that'll be going on from now until sometime in December. This episode is brought to you by FoundOutOnClothing.com and BunnySlippers.com. Subscribe to PGTTCM with D.B. Spitzer and Seraphie. Wherever you subscribe to podcasts, we prefer Podbean and Apple Podcasts. Check out the new website over at PGTTCM.com and check out the merch table over at PGTTCM.Threadless.com. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at PGTTCM. Or check us out on YouTube at People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Edited by Daniel Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod, featuring The Hive, Ghost Story, Ghost Processional, Oppressive Gloom, and our theme song, The Chamber. Chapter 13, The Picture. I wonder what that nice-looking beggar really means, and who he happens to be. That was what I said to myself when I returned to the library. If it is true that now and again, Providence does write a man's character on his face, then there can't be the slightest shred of doubt that a curious one's been written on his. I wonder what his connection has been with the Apostle, or if it's only part of his game of bluff. I strode up and down. For the moment, my interest in the experiments I was conducting had waned. If it was all bluff, I never saw a better piece of acting. And yet, what sort of finger can such a precision as St. Paul have in such a pie? The fellow seemed to squirm at the mere mention of the rising hope of the radical's name. Can the objection be political? Let me consider. What has Lessingham done which could offend the religious or patriotic susceptibilities of the most fanatical of Orientals? Politically, I can recall nothing. Foreign affairs, as a rule, he has carefully eschewed. If he has offended, and if he hasn't, the seeming was uncommonly good, The cause will have to be sought upon some other track. But then what track? The more I strove to puzzle it out, the greater the puzzlement grew. Absurd. The rascal has no more connection with St. Paul than St. Peter. The probability is that he's a crackpot. And if he isn't, he has some little game on foot, in close association with the hunt of the oof bird, which he tried to work off on me but couldn't. As for... for Marjorie... My Marjorie. Only, she isn't mine, confound it. If I had my senses about me, I should have broken his head in several places for daring to allow her name to pass his lips. The unbaptized Mohammedan, now to return to the chase of splendid murder. 
I snatched up my mask, one of the most ingenious inventions, by the way, of recent years. If the armies of the future wear my mask, they will defy my weapon. I was about to readjust it in its place when someone knocked at the door. Who's there? Come in. It was Edwards. He looked round him as if surprised. I beg your pardon, sir. I thought you were engaged. I didn't know that that gentleman had gone. He went up the chimney, as all that kind of gentlemen do. Why the deuce did you let him in when I told you not to? Really, sir, I don't know. I gave him your message, and he looked at me, and that is all I remember till I found myself standing in this room. Had it not been Edwards, I might have suspected him of having his palm well greased. But in his case, I knew better. It was as I thought. My visitor was a mesmerist of the first class. He had actually played some of his tricks in broad daylight on my servant at my own front door, a man worth studying. Edwards continued, There is someone else, sir, who wishes to see you, Mr. Lessingham. Mr. Lessingham? At that moment the juxtaposition seemed odd, though I dare say it was so rather in appearance than in reality. Show him in. Presently in came Paul. I am free to confess, I have owned it before, that in a sense I admire that man, so long as he does not presume to thrust himself into a certain position. He possesses physical qualities which please my eye, speaking as a mere biologist, like the suggestion conveyed by his every pose, his every movement, of a tenacious hold on life, of reserve force, of a repository of bone and gristle on which he can fall back at pleasure. The fellow's lithe and active, not hasty, yet agile, clean-built, well-hung, the sort of man who might be relied upon to make a good recovery. You might beat him in a sprint, mental or physical, though to do that you would have to be spry, but in a staying race he would see you out. I do not know that he is exactly the kind of man whom I would trust, unless I knew that he was on the job which knowledge in this case would be uncommonly hard to obtain. He is too calm, too self-contained, with a knack of looking all round him even in moments of extremest peril. And for whatever he does, he has a good excuse. He has the reputation, both in the house and out of it, of being a man of iron nerve, and with some reason, yet I am not so sure. Unless I read him wrongly, he is one of those individualities which, confronted by certain eventualities, collapse, to rise the moment of trial having passed like Phoenix from her ashes. However it might be with his adherence, he would show no trace of his disaster. And this was the man whom Marjorie loved. Well, she could show some cause. He was a man of position, destined probably to rise much higher, a man of parts, with capacity to make most of them not ill-looking, with agreeable manners, when he chose, and he came within the lady's definition of a gentleman. He always did the right thing, at the right time, in the right way. And yet, well, I take it that we are all cats, and that we most of us are prigs. For mercy's sake, do not let us all give ourselves away. He was dressed as a gentleman should be dressed. Black frock coat, black vest, dark gray trousers, stand-up collar, smartly tied bow, gloves of the proper shade, neatly polished hair, and a smile which, if it was not childlike, at any rate, was bland. I am not disturbing you. Not at all. Sure. I never enter a place like this, where a man is matching himself with nature to wrest from her her secrets without feeling that I am crossing the threshold of the unknown. The last time I was in this room was just after you had taken out the final patents for your system of telegraphy at sea, which the Admiralty purchased, wisely. What is it now? Death. No, really. What do you mean? If you are a member of the next government, you will possibly learn. I may offer them the refusal of a new wrinkle in the art of murder. I see. A new projectile. How long is this race to continue between attack and defense? Until the sun grows cold. And then? There will be no defense, nothing to defend. He looked at me with his calm, grave eyes. The theory of the age of ice, towards which we are advancing, is not a cheerful one. 
he began to finger a glass retort which lay upon a table. By the way, it was good of you to give me a look in last night. I am afraid you thought me peremptory. I have come to apologize. I don't know that I thought you peremptory. I thought you queer. Yes. He glanced at me with that expressionless look upon his face, which he could summon at will, and which is at the bottom of the superstition about his iron nerve. I was worried and not well. Besides, one doesn't care to be burgled even by a maniac. Was he a maniac? Did you see him? Very clearly. Where? In the street. How close were you to him? Closer than I am to you. Indeed. I didn't know you were so close to him as that. Did you try to stop him? Easier said than done. He was off at such a rate. Did you see how he was dressed, or rather undressed? I did. In nothing but a cloak on such a night. Who but a fanatic would have attempted burglary in such a costume? Did he take anything? Absolutely nothing. It seems to have been a curious episode. He moved his eyebrows. According to members of the house, the only gesture in which he has been known to indulge. We become accustomed to curious escapades. Oblige me by not mentioning it to anyone. To anyone. He repeated the last two words, as if to give them emphasis. I wondered if he was thinking of Marjorie. I am communicating with the police. Until they move, I don't want it to get into the papers or to be talked about. It's a worry, you understand? I nodded. He changed the theme. This that you're engaged upon, is it a projectile or a weapon? If you are a member of the next government, you will possibly know. If you aren't, you possibly won't. I suppose you have to keep this sort of thing secret. I do. It seems that matters of much less moment you wish to keep secret. You mean that business of last night? If a trifle of that sort gets into the papers, or gets talked about, which is the same thing, you have no notion how we are pestered. It becomes an almost unbearable nuisance. Jones the Unknown can commit murder with less inconvenience to himself than Jones the Notorious can have his pocket picked. There is not so much exaggeration in that as there sounds. Goodbye. Thanks for the promise. I had given him no promise, but that was by the way. He turned as to go, then stopped. There's another thing. I believe you're a specialist on questions of ancient superstitions and extinct religions. I am interested in such subjects, but I am not a specialist. Can you tell me what were the exact tenets of the worshippers of Isis? Neither I nor any man with scientific certainty. As you know, she had a brother. The cult of Osiris and Isis was one and the same. What precisely were its dogmas or its practices or anything about it, none now can tell. The papyri, hieroglyphics and so on which remain are so very far from being exhaustive, and our knowledge of those which do remain is still less so. I suppose that the marvels which are told of it are purely legendary. To what marvels do you particularly refer? Weren't supernatural powers attributed to the priests of Isis? Broadly speaking at that time, supernatural powers were attributed to all the priests of all the creeds. I see. Presently he continued, I presume that her cult is long since extinct, that none of the worshippers of Isis exist today. I hesitated. I was wondering why he had hit on such a subject. If he really had a reason, or if he was merely asking questions as a cover for something else. You see, I knew my Paul. That is not so sure. He looked at me with that passionless, yet searching gaze of his. You think that she still is worshipped? I think it possible, even probable, that here and there in Africa, Africa is a large order, homage is paid to Isis quite in the good old way. Do you know that as a fact? Excuse me, but do you know it as a fact? Are you aware that you are treating me as if I was on the witness stand? Have you any special purpose in making these inquiries? He smiled. In a kind of way I have. I have recently come across rather a curious story. I am trying to get to the bottom of it. What is the story? I am afraid that at present I am not liberty to tell it to you. When I am, I will. 
you will find it interesting as an instance of a singular survival. Didn't the followers of Isis believe in transmigration? Some of them, no doubt. What did they understand by transmigration? Transmigration. Yes, but of the soul or of the body. How do you mean? Transmigration is transmigration. Are you driving at something in particular? If you'll tell me fairly and squarely what it is, I'll do my best to give you the information you require. As it is, your questions are a bit perplexing. Oh, it doesn't matter. As you say, transmigration is transmigration. I was eyeing him keenly. I seemed to detect in his manner an odd reluctance to enlarge on the subject he himself had started. He continued to trifle with the retort upon the table. Hadn't the followers of Isis a, what shall I say, a sacred emblem? How? Hadn't they in a special regard for some sort of a, wasn't it some sort of a beetle? You mean Scarabus Saucer. According to Latriel, Scarabus Egyptorium? Undoubtedly, the scarab was venerated throughout Egypt. Indeed, speaking generally, most things that had life, for instance, cats. As you know, Osiris continued among men in the figure of Apis the bull. Weren't the priests of Isis, or some of them, supposed to assume after death the form of a scarabus? I have never heard of it. Are you sure? Think. I shouldn't like to answer such a question positively offhand, but I don't, on the spur of the moment, recall any supposition of the kind. Don't laugh at me. I'm not a lunatic. But I understand that recent researches have shown that even in some of the most astounding of the ancient legends, there was a substratum of fact. Is it absolutely certain that there could be no shred of truth in such a belief? In what belief? In the belief that a priest of Isis, or anyone, assumed after death the form of a scarabus? It seems to me, Lessingham, that you have lately come across some uncommonly interesting data, of a kind, too, which it is your bounden duty to give to the world, or at any rate, to that portion of the world which is represented by me. Come, tell us all about it. What are you afraid of? I am afraid of nothing, and some day you shall be told, but not now. At present, answer my question. Then repeat your question clearly. Is it absolutely certain that there could be no foundation of truth in the belief that a priest of Isis, or anyone, assumed after death the form of a beetle? I know no more than the man in the moon. How the dickens should I? Such a belief may have been symbolical. Christians believe that after death the body takes the shape of worms, and so, in a sense, it does, and sometimes eels. That is not what I mean. Then what do you mean? Listen, if a person of whose veracity there could not be a vestige of a doubt, assured you that he had seen such a transformation actually take place, could it conceivably be explained on natural grounds? Seen a priest of Isis assume the form of a beetle? Or a follower of Isis? Before or after death? He hesitated. I had seldom seen him wear such an appearance of interest. To be frank, I was keenly interested too, but on a sudden there came into his eyes a glint of something that was almost terror. When he spoke, it was with the most unwanted awkwardness. In, in the very act of dying. In the act of dying? If he had seen a follower of Isis in the very act of dying assume the form of a beetle, on any conceivable grounds would such a transformation be susceptible of a natural explanation? I stared, as who would not? Such an extraordinary question was rendered more extraordinary by coming from such a man. Yet I was almost beginning to suspect that there was something behind it more extraordinary still. Look here, Lessingham. I can see you've a capital tale to tell. So tell it, man. Unless I'm mistaken, it's not the kind of tale in which ordinary scruples can have any part or parcel. Anyhow... It's hardly fair of you to set my curiosity all agog, and then to leave it unappeased. He eyed me steadily, the appearance of interest fading more and more, until presently 
His face assumed its wanted, expressionless mask. Somehow I was conscious that what he had seen in my face was not altogether to his liking. His voice was once more bland and self-contained. I perceive you are of opinion that I have been told of teradiddle. I suppose I have. But what is the teradiddle? Don't you see I'm burning? Unfortunately, Atherton, I am on my honor. Until I have permission to unloose it, my tongue is tied. He picked up his hat and umbrella from where he had placed them on the table. Holding them in his left hand, he advanced to me with his right outstretched. It is very good of you to suffer my continued interruption. I know to my sorrow what such interruptions mean. Believe me, I am not ungrateful. What is this? On the shelf, within a foot or so of where I had stood, was a sheet of paper, the size and shape of half a sheet of post-note. At this he stooped to glance. As he did so, something surprisingly occurred. On the instant, a look came to his face which literally transfigured him. His hat and umbrella fell from his grasp onto the floor. He retreated, gibbering, his hands held out as if to ward something off from him, until he reached the wall on the other side of the room. A more amazing spectacle than he presented I never saw. Lessingham, I exclaimed, what's wrong with you? My first impression was that he was struck by a fit of epilepsy, though anyone less like an epileptic subject it would be hard to find. In my bewilderment, I looked round to see what could be the immediate cause. My eye fell upon the sheet of paper. I stared at it with considerable surprise. I had not noticed it there previously. I had not put it there. Where had it come from? The curious thing was that on it, produced apparently by some process of photogravure, was an illustration of a species of beetle with which I felt that I ought to be acquainted, and yet was not. It was of a dull golden green, the color was so well brought out, even to the extent of seeming to scintillate, and the whole thing was so dexterously done that the creature seemed alive. The semblance of reality was, indeed, so vivid that it needed a second glance to be assured that it was a mere trick of the reproducer. Its presence there was odd. After what we had been talking about, it might seem to need explanation, but it was absurd to suppose that that alone could have had such an effect on a man like Lessingham. With the thing in my hand, I crossed to where he was. Pressing his back against the wall, he had shrunk lower, inch by inch, till he was actually crouching on his haunches. Lessingham, come, man, what's wrong with you? Taking him by the shoulder, I shook him with some vigor. My touch had on him the effect of seeming to wake him out of a dream, of restoring him to consciousness as against the nightmare horrors with which he was struggling. He gazed up at me with that look of cunning on his face which one associates with abject terror. Atherton, is it you? It's all right. Quite right. I'm well, very well. As he spoke, he slowly drew himself up till he was standing erect. Then in that case... All I can say is that you have a queer way of being very well. He put his hand up to his mouth, as if to hide the trembling of his lips. It's the pressure of overwork. I've had one or two attacks like this, but it's nothing, only a local lesion. I observed him keenly. To my thinking, there was something about him which was very odd indeed. Only a local lesion? If you take my strongly urged advice, you'll get a medical opinion without delay if you haven't been wise enough to have done so already. I'll go today at once, but I know it's only mental overstrain. You're sure it's nothing to do with this? I held out in front of him the photogravure of the beetle. As I did so, he backed away from me, shrieking, trembling as with palsy. Take it away! Take it away! he screamed. I stared at him for some seconds, astonished into speechlessness. Then I found my tongue. Lessingham! It's only a picture. Are you stark mad? He persisted in his ejaculations. Take it away, take it away, tear it up, burn it. His agitation was so unnatural, from whatever cause it arose, that fearing the recurrence of the attack from which he had just recovered, I did as he bade me. I tore the sheet of paper into quarters, and striking a match, set fire to each separate piece. He watched the process of incineration as if fascinated. When it was concluded, 
and nothing but ashes remained, he gave a gasp of relief. Lessingham, I said, you're either mad already or you're going mad. Which is it? I think it's neither. I believe I am as sane as you. It's, it's that story of which I was speaking. It, it seems curious, but I'll tell you all about it someday. As I observed, I think you will find it an interesting instance of a singular survival. He made an obvious effort to become more like his usual self. It is extremely unfortunate, Atherton, that I should have troubled you with such a display of weakness, especially as I am able to offer you so scant an explanation. One thing I would ask of you, to observe strict confidence. What has taken place has been between ourselves. I am in your hands, but you are my friend. I know I can rely on you not to speak of it to anyone, and in particular, not to breathe a hint of it to Miss Linden. Why in particular not to Miss Linden? Can you not guess? I hunched my shoulder. If what I guess is what you mean, is not that a cause the more why silence would be unfair to her? It is for me to speak, if for anyone. I shall not fail to do what should be done. Give me your promise that you will not hint a word to her of what you have so unfortunately seen. I gave him the promise he required. There was no more work for me that day. The apostle, his divigations, his example of the Coleoptera, his Arabian friend, these things were as microbes which, acting on a system already predisposed for their reception, produced high fever. I was in a fever of unrest, brain in a whirl, Marjorie, Paul, Isis, Beetle, mesmerism, in delirious jumble, love's upsetting, in itself a sufficiently severe disease, but when complications intervene, suggestive of mystery and novelties, so that you do not know if you are moving in an atmosphere of dreams or of frozen facts. If then your temperature does not rise like that rocket of Monsieur Verne's, which reached the moon, then you are a freak of an entirely genuine kind, and if the surgeons do not preserve you and place you on view in pickle, they ought to, for the sake of historical doubters. For no one will believe that there will ever was a man like you, unless you yourself are somewhere around to prove them Thomas's. Myself, I am not that man. When I get warm, I grow heated, and when I am heated, there is likely to be a variety show of a gaudy kind. When Paul had gone, I tried to think things out, and if I kept on trying, something would have happened. So I went on to the river instead. End of chapter 13 Recording by Alan Winteroud BoomCoach.blogspot.com